certainly there is one more part to this one, and that's hybridization. Um, the whole point behind hybridization is that you will have orbitals overlap because there will be a little bit more stable in terms of the geometry we see, and it um, reduces how much energy is needed for that molecule to form. Remembering that electrons have to overlap in order to form a bond. However, you don't want them so close together that they repel one another. So this is just kind of give you an idea of how the length between the two atoms will cause some attraction, but if you get them too close, you'll have repulsion. And if you don't get them close enough, you won't have any attraction whatsoever. And so there is an energy that actually, if we look at this one, this is giving off energy, which is why you will have certain bonds form of certain lengths. With an sp3 hybridization, we talked about how this involves four pairs of electrons, four pa um, or let me put it this way, four pairs of electrons which can come from bonded pairs or lone electron pairs. Since you have eight electrons involved, you need four orbitals to store those electrons in. We take the s orbital and three p orbitals, and we combine those together to kind of make a mushroom-like shape. And that's how we get our tetrahedral geometry. When we have an sp2 hybridization, we're only showing three pairs of electrons. Um, when you have something like boron, that's pretty standard to have less than four. You will sometimes see this with a multiple bonded um, atom, and that's because the double bond, again, is not going into the hybridized orbitals. It's going into the p orbitals that are found above and below the axis. With an sp hybridization, we just have one of the p orbitals along with the s, um, and the other two would be used. The other two p orbitals would be used to handle a multiple bond, or it'll just be a molecule that is stable with two pairs of electrons. When we get into DSP3 and D2SP3, we are having atoms that can hold more than four pairs of electrons that violate the octet rule by going above four pairs. And that's when we will see a, a fifth orbital come into play, which will be D or D2, depending on how many areas of electrons are around that central atom. And so we just talked about DSP3. This would be an example of D2SP3. So you're only going to see D2SP3 with molecules that are coming from an octahedral-like geometry. You'll only see DSP3 with molecules coming from a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. So this just kind of summarizes the pairs of electrons. Remember, multiple bonds only count as one pair. And the types of hybridization you will see between the orbitals, your SP and the D orbitals, to give you the various geometries that we've talked about. Sigma and pi bonding, as we talked about in class, sigma is a single bond. Pi bond would be found in both a double and a triple bond. Sigma bond are the actual pair of electrons that are shared between the two atoms um, axes. In other words, the one that connects them straight and align together. The pi bonds are the pairs of electrons that are found in a multiple bond above and below the axis. So this may give you a better example of what I'm talking about here with a double bond. We'll have a pair of electrons that are shared directly between the two carbon atoms. We'll have a pair that's also shared above it, and that's going to give us our pi bond. And if you had had a triple bond, you would also see a pi bond in the lower half as well. So NF3, so we're going to take a look at what the structure would be. Um, we drew this one a little earlier. We see that there are four areas of electrons surrounding the nitrogen atom. So that means that we need four orbitals, which would be an sp3 hybridization. With UF6, this is similar to SEF6, we're going to have six pairs of electrons surrounding the central atom. And so we need six orbitals. We already have the sp3 for four of them. The other two will come from d2. Clf3. 
if we draw this one out, we see that there are five pairs of electrons around chlorine. I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. I know, I'm bad. Um, these are molecules you all have drawn before, um, but I will pause after this one. ClF3 has five pairs of electrons around the central atom, so we need five orbitals. DSP3. So if you'd like to pause, this would be the time to do so. Here we have DH3, three pairs of electrons surrounding boron, so we need three orbitals. We always start with an S and we add on P's, so we will only need two at P orbitals, giving us SP2. I would pause now if you need to pause. And I believe this is our last one. There may be one more after this. Sorry, guys. C2H4. When we draw this one out, we have a double bond between the two carbon atoms. Um, so if we're going to look at the hybridization of this one, we're going to see that carbon has one, two, three pairs of electrons, or three areas would be the better way to phrase it, three areas of electrons surrounding that central atom. So there would need to be three hybridized orbitals, and that would be sp2. Again, that double bond, the other pair of electrons would just be in an unhybridized p orbital. I do think we have two more. We're going to deal with stigma and pi at this point. Um, so if you need to pause, please do so now. So we're going to look at how many sigma and pi bonds are in CO and carbon monoxide will have a triple bond between carbon and oxygen. So the triple bond will consist of three electron pairs, one being in sigma, and then the other two being pi bonds. And our last question for this review section will be C2H4. That's the one we just did. Okay, And we talked about how on each of the carbons we have a double bond between the two carbon atoms, single bonds on the two hydrogen atoms, so we're going to have one sigma for the double bond, and then one sigma for each of the carbon-hydrogen bonds, so that'll be three sigmas, and one pi for the multiple bond. All right, and that's the end of this review portion, and then we're going to move on to some new stuff in the next few videos.